Welcome to Someone You Should Know, a program where we meet interesting people from our area that you may not know. I'm your host, Scott Stevenson. Today, we are pleased to have Professor Vincent Canato. Professor Vincent Canato. Vin got his undergraduate degree from Williams College and his PhD in history from Columbia University. He is an associate professor of history at UMass Boston, and his interests include 20th century urban and political history, including history of the city of New York and Boston. Also immigration and ethnic history, and he is the author of American Passage, the history of Ellis Island. Vin grew up in the suburbs of New York City as a fan of the New York Yankees. He's a member of the Society for Baseball Research, also known as Sabre, and he teaches a class at the UMass Boston called the History of Baseball. Baseball began in Hoboken, New Jersey in 1846, some 175 years ago. Over 20,000 people have played in the major leagues. And now Professor Canato will boil those 20,000 players down to the 10 greatest baseball players of all time. Thank you very much, Scott. Thank you and hello, welcome. Good, so uh, my talk today is the 10 greatest baseball players with an asterisk plus others, and you'll see what I mean by that uh, in uh, a couple of minutes. I'm a historian. I'm a trained historian as well as a baseball fan. And as Scott said, I teach a course at UMass Boston on baseball history. So I'm a fan, but I'm also looking at this as a historian would look at. So I'm looking at baseball uh, using the tools that historians use. And when we look at baseball, we have to think that baseball is a sport in some ways very much unique in that it's obsessed with both its history as well as statistics. Now, every, every sport has its own statistics. It has goals, and wins, and assists, uh, but there's no other sport that has the wealth of statistics that baseball creates. Uh, and especially in the last 30 years, uh, the, the amount of statistical uh, statistics has only increased as uh, statistically minded fans and others have created new stats to which with which we can understand the game. And it's also a game that is uh, that is obsessed with its history. Uh, it's the first to have a, a Hall of Fame in the 30s, which is part of creating that history. Uh, many, some teams have Old Timers Day where they bring back old players. And so those two allow us to kind of have these debates about who the best players were. I'm much more concerned about asking questions uh, about how we decide who the greatest players are than what the actual list looks like. All of you out there would have your own list of who the greatest are, and there's a great deal of subjectivity involved. But uh, when I talk about this, I'm gonna try to lay out um, how we think about who's the greatest player. And, and by doing that, we have to think historically. So we wanna avoid presentism, we wanna avoid uh, thinking about baseball simply as a, a, a resident of the early 21st century. We wanna be thinking about the historical contexts of that players played in in the past. Uh, we're not putting players head to head. We're not putting Ty Cobb up against Jason DeGrom, uh, against DeGrom. That's just, that's ahistorical. So we have to look at each player in his own time period. Think about the ranking of US presidents. That's another kind of fun ranking game. Uh, we wouldn't say that, oh, Abraham Lincoln really isn't a great president because if he was president today, you know, he wouldn't be able to deal with social media and all the other things that we have, the complexity of society. Uh, that's not how we judge presidents. We judge Lincoln by, according to the sets of problems that he had at that period of time in the 1860s. We want to avoid uh, a couple of biases we want to avoid. One is the present bias, right? It's the bias that thinks that uh, today is better than the past. Players are bigger and they're stronger, they're faster than players in the, in the past. So therefore, they're, they're, they're better than any player in the past. Uh, 
one element of this is saying that today's ball players represent a much more diverse array of talent, both domestically and internationally. Uh, there's no no longer segregation in baseball, and there's a great deal more competition than players faced in the early 20th century. And that's certainly true. Uh, but we can't blame players in the early 20th century uh, because they didn't play against players from all around the world. Uh, today's players see, uh, besides higher speed fastballs, they see all kinds of pitches that uh, you know, 80, 90, 100 years ago players didn't really see, like sliders and cutters. Uh, the other thing about today is that batters uh, have a tougher time because they don't face uh, the relief pitchers that we have today. Relief pitching has become so specialized in our own day that it's very common for a starter to pitch five or six innings, get a little tired, bow out, and you get a fresh reliever who comes in and throws 100 miles an hour, and maybe you get three of those relievers pitching one inning each to the end of the game. Uh, you know, 60, 70, 80 years ago, most starters went, if not the whole game, most of the game, uh, so that batters saw much tired starting starting pitchers. So that's an advantage that today's pitchers have. Uh, the other part of present bias is that these are just the players we watch and know. So we tend to think of them, we tend generally to put them on a pedestal, whereas players you know, from the past, like uh, Walter Johnson or Hannes Wagner, are, are players that we might know the name of or seen a picture of, uh, but we don't know that much about them. So there's a tendency to kind of downplay them. The, the flip side of that bias is nostalgic bias. I right? think there's another, another individual who thinks that the past was always better. The president is, the president is corrupted. Uh, play the game was, was better in the past, more pure. Uh, and there were, you know, there were elements of difficulty that players in the past had to face. Um, pitchers didn't have innings limits. They pitched a lot more innings. Excuse me. Players had inferior equipment. If you look at the gloves of, of old-time players, they're 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 awful. It's like they're falling apart, as opposed to the fancy equipment that we have today. Uh, there were no elbow guards a hundred years ago. Uh, elbow guards today allow batters to crowd the plate and puts pitchers at a somewhat disadvantage. Uh, players didn't even have helmets uh, 75, 80 years ago. Players might not have had to face cutters or sliders back then, but there were a lot more illegal pitches like spitballs and scuff balls. But there's an argument to be made that, that we're in an era where pitchers are, are doing something to the ball in this day and age. They're scuffing or adding something. Uh, that's another story. The quality of the fields in the past were poor. Outfield fences in some stadiums were really far away. This made it difficult. Uh, the quality of fields made it difficult for fielders. The deep outfield fences made it harder to hit home runs. In the past, baseball was a part-year profession. Most players had to make money in the offseason, so they couldn't spend the whole year training. Uh, today's baseball players basically train year-round, uh, and that helps them be far more athletic and in much better condition because they're just out there getting better. And, and the ability to train uh, using video and advanced technology has just increased in recent years. In the past, players traveled by bus and train rather than airplanes. There are just less creature comforts and less pampering of athletes. So that made it a little tougher to be a baseball player in the past. So we're gonna put both of those aside. We don't think the past is worse and we don't think the past is better. We wanna take the players and just examine them within the context of their own time periods and their own careers. So in terms of understanding players and comparing over time, we've got to use statistics. And as I mentioned earlier, there's been an explosion of statistics in the last 40 years, the rise of what's known as saber metrics. Bill James, sort of the godfather of saber metrics. Uh, when I was a kid, it was, you know, geeky baseball fans like myself always got the Bill James handbook, whatever Bill James published, and all kinds of data uh, that was available. One thing that, that, that sabermetrics has, has led to is a diminution of older statistics. So we no longer look at batting average or RBIs quite the same way as in the past. They're still useful, but they're not the gold standard for measuring baseball players. Uh, we have new statistics like war, wins above replacement, which is uh, how many wins 
that player got for his team above what the baseline replacement player would have done, the AAA player going up to the majors. And that's a way to judge players across time because, you know, a win at, a win is a win, whether it's in 1910 or whether it's in 2010. There is always a problem of judging defense uh, in terms of statistics. Uh, for a long time, the main award was the, or still is, the Golden Glove Award. Uh, and there were some years that the Golden Glove was just given out to the best offensive players. Uh, and, and there was no rhyme or reason why they got these defensive awards, other than that they were really good players. There's been an attempt to get more defensive metrics involved, uh, but they, are, they lag behind offensive measurements. Um, so the question still remains, how do you measure across time periods of baseball? You've got war. Oh, OPS is another of the new statistics I didn't mention. OPS is taking on base percentage, which has become a big, uh, especially after Moneyball was a big statistic. And you add that to slugging percentage and it gives you OPS. And an OPS is seen as a good way to measure offensive production, all around offering offensive production. So as I said, how do we measure offensive versus defensive production? I think whenever you say the best players ever, there's gonna be a bias towards offensive productions. The home run hitters, the ones who get lots of hits, the ones, uh, those are the players that we're going to, the everyday players, we're gonna look at their offensive production much more. Uh, and offense gen generally generates more wins than defense. Uh, we have a picture of Ozzy Smith here, one of the greatest defensive shortstops of all time. Uh, and a great player, no doubt. And, you know, a decent offensive player, but, uh, but known much more for his glove. Brooks Robinson was another, you know, great defensive player, very good offensive player. But um, they still, their, their defense doesn't quite carry them or push them up uh, to the elite levels. They're still up there pretty high. They're still Hall of Famers. Omar Vizquel is another example. Omar Vizquel, I think, has did not quite get 3,000 hits. I think he was around 2,800 hits, but a great offensive infield, a defensive infielder. And then there's a case of catchers, right? What catchers do, uh, there was, there's some power catchers that we've had over time. Mike Piazza is a good example of a power catcher. Uh, but the problem with catchers are twofold. One is that catchers tend to have shorter careers. It's really tough to be behind the plate all the time. Um, but the other problem is that really the value in catchers and having great catchers is in how they handle pitchers. And that is a hard thing to measure. There have been attempts to, to measure uh, framing, how catchers frame pitches, you know, how many strikes they get by the way they frame a pitch ball. So we're getting more statistics like that, but it's still hard to measure the, um, you know, the added value of defense for catchers. So offense still kind of hold, carries the day when we think about the greatest players ever. Here's another issue. Well, what do we think about shortish careers? I, I put ish because you'll see some of these players had relatively long careers. These are players that had like relatively shorter periods of unbelievably great years. Sandy Koufax is the best example. He had a 12 year career. Uh, and in that career, he had five of the most dominant pitching years uh, in baseball history. The problem was, well, one, he kind of got off to a slow start in his career. Uh, and then his career, uh, right when he's right in the middle of this great run of dominance, he retires. He's, his shoulder hurts, his arm hurts. Uh, he doesn't want to permanently damage his arm. And he decides enough is enough. He hangs it up. Uh, Kovacs, clearly one of the greatest pitchers of all time, but not quite in the higher level. Uh, Mickey Mantle, another great player, relatively long career, but the last few years, he was really hobbled uh, by knee injuries, and it affected his production tremendously. Uh, and there's Pedro Martinez, who had sort of like Koufax, but a little bit of a longer career, a few more dominant years. These are definitely Hall of Fame players, um, but I think when we look at baseball players, we're looking at long, uh, high production over a long career. And there has to be kind of his consistently high production over that long career. Uh, that brings up another question. What about long careers? 
Uh, Pete Rose, controversial figure, he played for 24 years. Is the most hits, most games played, most at bats. These are longevity. These are mostly longevity things. Um, certainly one of the great players, but not in the top echelon of players, right? Because a, a lot of what he got was due to the fact that he just played a long time. And for pitchers, we have pitchers like Burp Lyleb, and here's Phil Necro, the knuckleballer showing off his knuckleball. I mean, they had over 20 year careers, which is crazy. I, I don't know if there's going to be any pitchers these days uh, anymore who are going to have 20 plus year careers, unless they're knuckleballers. Um, both of them had, you know, both of them are in the Hall of Fame. Uh, Negro about 300 wins. Bly Levin didn't quite get there, but look how many losses they had. Right? Lots of strikeouts. Their ERAs are okay. They're good. They're in the threes, but not, you know, not super great. So they definitely had sort of marginal Hall of Fame careers, but not quite in the top 50 um, of all-time players. Another question people ask is, what about postseason? Does postseason count if you're a really good player? Uh, by the way, if you're thinking about where's the top 10, we're getting to the top 10. Be patient. The um, Ted Williams is a great example, a great baseball player. Uh, not much of a postseason career. He was in one World Series where he, uh, he batted, uh, what is that, uh, 200, I think, uh, with one RBI. Uh, Manny Ramirez, Derek Jeter, both Hall of Fame players, uh, but tremendous postseason numbers. Now, remember, there were a lot more postseason games today than there were in the past. So these were kind of inflated because they're playing a lot more postseason games. Uh, both of them had, were terrific postseason players, uh, but I don't think that's enough to push them, you know, into the top 20 or 30 baseball players of all time. And similarly, Ted Williams' is, you know, poor showing in his one World Series doesn't, uh, doesn't knock him down from, from where he's at. Here's another issue. What about personal issues? Uh, we have Pete Rose here and the gambling issue. Pete Rose uh, can't be, is not allowed to, to be in the Hall of Fame. I think he probably should be. Uh, he had the accusation was that he had gambled on baseball while met being manager of the Reds. Uh, what about Ty Cobb? There are accusations that he was a mean person and a racist. Um, what about Kurt Schilling? This is the current controversy. There's a lot of people believe he um, he's not going to get into the Hall of Fame because uh, of his political beliefs, and you know he's very vocal about his politics, and he's fallen short, just barely fallen short of Hall of Fame over the last few years. And I believe next year is his last year of eligibility. And I think he said he's not interested in going up for it. What about Willie Mays and Mickey Mantle? A lot of people forget that they were both suspended from baseball in their retirement years because they were uh, hired by a Atlantic City Casino to be representatives of the casino. Um, does that should that impact how we judge them? And then finally, there's the issue of steroids, right? And we're going to get to steroids at the end of our list. Another issue is what role does historic significance play? You know, Jackie Robinson, one of the most important historic figures in Major League Baseball, a Hall of Famer, a terrific ball player. Uh, do you get bonus points for uh, historic significance? Less historical, but still important are some of these streaks. Joe DiMaggio's 56-game uh, hitting streak, Cal Ripken's consecutive game record. Now, these are great ball. These are all Hall of Fame ball players. But do we give them extra points for for holding these records or being uh, a person of historical significance. Another question is what about 19th century players? As you'll see from my list, uh, with one exception, one player who straddles the 19th and 20th centuries, most of the players are from the 20th century. When we get into the 19th century, it's still baseball, it's still professional baseball, uh, but I'm putting those players off to the side, it becomes harder to judge because the game is just a little bit different in the late 19th century compared to the modern era. Uh, some of the great players, this is Cap Anson, Billy Hamilton, uh, pitcher Ed, Del Ed Delahanty, uh, King Kelly, Mike King Kelly, played for the uh, Boston team, Kid Nichols. These are all terrific players of the 19th century, but they are generally uh, measured in their own category uh, and not with more mod the modern era. So 
We're going to start with number, I've, I've given it away. Instead of going from number 10 down, I'm going to work I'm from number 10 up. I'm going to start from number one and go down because to me, the number one best plug race player of all time is kind of anticlimactic. It's Babe Ruth. And I, I would say it's hard to argue against Babe Ruth as the greatest player. Uh, numbers wise, you know, he held the home run record for a long time. Uh, not anymore. He still holds the record for slugging percentage for OPS. Remember, OPS is on base percentage plus slugging. He has the career uh, record for that. He has 162.1 wins above replacement. That's just offensive because there's Babe Ruth, the offense, the, the, the batter, but there's also Babe Ruth, the pitcher. For 10 years, he was a pitcher and he won almost 100 games. And he got 20 extra wins above replacement just from pitching. So his 182 wins above replacement is first place of all players. So he was a he was a great hitter, but also a pretty good pitcher. And then on top of that, Ruth, unlike almost any other player here, changed the nature of baseball and how it was played. Right? Jackie Robinson changed the nature of baseball in terms of integrating it. Ruth changed in terms of how it was played. Uh, in 1920, he hit 54 home runs. The next highest total was 19. This was the dead ball era prior to 1920. People went for singles and doubles and, and hits and runs. And it's Ruth, almost single-handedly, who turns baseball into a home run hitting game. And players see the success of Ruth, and they start also hitting home runs. And it changes the way baseball is played from the 20s, really onward down to today. He's also one of the first modern American celebrities at the time. Uh, the idea of a sports figure or you have movie actors in the 20s, be, like Valentino, becoming celebrities. Uh, Ruth is right up there, and, and Ruth and his agent are incredibly savvy about creating an image of Ruth as a celebrity and selling that image. Uh, it's another aspect of, of Ruth, but clearly, I think, the greatest player of all time. The second greatest is Willie Mays. Uh, Mays is what we call the classic five-tool player. So the five tools are hitting for power, hitting for average, uh, running, fielding, and throwing. And he could do all of it at, a, at an elite level. Uh, usually when scouts measure, they'll measure all of these at according to numbers. He, he has elite, elite five tools. Started off uh, in the Negro Leagues and then plays nearly all of his career in the major leagues uh, with the, the New York Giants, then the San Francisco Giants, and then uh, a, kind of a sad season or two at the end with the, with the Mets where he's, he's really at the end of his career. He has a long career, again, long career, uh, playing consistently high levels of baseball, 660 homers, 1,903 uh, 1, RBIs, over 300 batting average, uh, an OPS of 942, uh, 941, which is not quite as high as, as Ruth's, but still uh, anything over nine, anything over 800 on an OPS is very good. Anything over 900 is elite. Anything over 1,000 is, you know, in, in, in its own category. And you have his, he's got 338 stolen bases. So he's got the power and the steals. And over his long career, he is, uh, he creates 156 wins above replacement. That's a top 10, I believe, of all time. Number three is Ted Williams. Uh, widely recognized as the greatest pure hitter of all time. He, um, he writes a book. If, if, if any of you uh, have read the book, I think it's The Art of Hitting. It's a terrific book, and it's still very useful in terms of thinking about hitting. Uh, he had terrific, as most great hitters do, terrific eyesight, uh, and could tell which pitches were his pitches, which pitches he wanted to hit, um, and which pitches to lay off. So therefore, he has an on-base percentage of almost 500. So he is on base almost half of his at-bats. That's incredible. That's the record. Uh, a 1.116 OPS. Uh, his 521 homers. Uh, his lifetime batting average 344. He's a two-time MVP. He's the last player to hit 400. Uh, we've kind of downgraded batting average, but still 400 is is pretty good. And hasn't been beat. Hasn't been. Um, we we haven't had anyone hit 400 for a season since then. But he was a difficult personality at the time. We tend to forget that. And he was also an indifferent fielder. He didn't care that much about fielding. Um, so 
do the, per, the personal issues affect how we rank players? I would say in this case, no. Right, Williams, uh, his his numbers speak for themselves. Uh, very long career at a very high level. Number four is uh, Henry Aaron. Okay, twenty three year career, consistently high offensive performance, all time home run record before Barry Bonds. Um, his 2,297 RBIs is a career, is a, is a, is a record, it holds the most in baseball history. Uh, he's got 3,700, over 3,700 hits. Uh, he's got a 928 OPS, 143 wins above replacement, and he's got one MVP award. Again, widely recognized as one of the greatest offensive performers in baseball history. Not quite up to the, the level defense of Willie Mays, but still all around uh, a great ball player. We get to our first pitcher, Walter Big Train Johnson. And now we also go back in time a little bit to the early 20th century. It's a 21 year career. You see, this is an era of pitchers uh, winning 417 wins. He's got a 2.17 ERA and his whip. Here's another kind of newish stat wins, are, uh, whip is uh, hits and walks divided by innings. So he, um, he has just about the same number. If you added the walks and hits, the same. It's about the same number as innings pitched. Uh, anything around one is terrific. Uh, he averaged almost 300 innings a year. That, that's insane. I mean, there are only just a few pitchers in, in current game uh, who pitch more than 200 innings to 250. And he's got 152 wins above replacement. So a lot of wins he provided for his team, his the Washington um, Senators. He was a two-time MVP. He holds the record for 110 shutouts, 3,500 strikeouts. Uh, he was the hardest pitcher of his ear, throwing pitcher of his era, but we're not sure how fast he was. We didn't have speed guns back then. Some people say that his, his pitches were in the upper 90s, but others say it was more in the low 90s. So not entirely clear, but what we can say is for the period of the early 20th century, uh, Johnson dominated baseball uh, in ways that you don't see, you won't see today. You won't see pitchers pitching 300 innings a year. I don't think we'll ever see a pitcher with more than 400 wins in a season. Number six is Ty Cobb, uh, the man who defined the era before Babe Ruth, the dead ball era. 24 seasons, he had 12 batting titles, one MVP, his 366 batting average is the highest of all time. He had over 4,000 hits. Uh, Pete Rose broke his record, hit 295 triples and almost 900 stolen bases. So we see a different style of play, one that's not geared towards the home run, that's geared towards hitting singles and doubles, uh, it's geared towards in tri in getting triples, uh, running, uh, hit and run, that kind of a creating runs, creating hits, and 150 war is up there in the top 10 of all time. But Cobb, of course, had a prickly personality. There were accusations of racism against him. I will say that there was a biography of Cobb that was published a few years ago. I think the, the man's name was Learson who published it. I, I can't remember it. Uh, it's a terrific biography. And in it, he claims that the accusations against Cobb were um, exaggerations, that he was not the, the villain that we think of him today and that popular culture has turned him into. Uh, I'll, all I'll say is you should go and, and if you're interested, go and read the, bio, the latest biography of Ty Cobb and uh, read for yourself and come up, to, come up uh, to your, with your own judgments on Cobb's career. But in terms of his playing, uh, definitely one of the greatest of all time. Number seven, Stan the Man Usual. Another very long career, 20 plus year career, amassed a lot of hits, led the league in hitting seven times. He's got a 976 OPS. So remember, anything above 900 is, is elite. But when you go above one OPS, that's, that's outstanding. A little bit lower on the wins above replacement. Uh, he was a three time MVP and the runner up for four other times. So we have, uh, we have some really great seasons that he put together in addition to this longish career. Number eight is the Iron Horse, Lou Gehrig, uh, known for before Cal Ripken playing in the most consecutive games. He played 17 seasons. His career is cut short. 
because of uh, ALS, because of his disease. He has, uh, so he, his numbers are, are slightly lower. He's got, he doesn't quite have 500 homers, doesn't quite get to 2,000 RBIs, uh, but he has an on-base percentage of 0. .447 which is right up there with uh, Ted Williams. His lifetime OPS is over one. Uh, he was a two-time MVP. His war is a little lower, 1.17. We talked about postseason earlier, uh, and Garrick had a tremendous postseason record. He had a 1.2 OPS in postseason, which is in insane. Uh, so he's producing lots of offense for these really great New York Yankees baseball teams. And, you know, we talked about historic significance. How important is that? I'll just say that, you know, he's also famous for his speech, the luckiest man on the face of the earth. Uh, in my view, it's not just one of the great speeches in baseball history, but it's one of the great speeches in American history. And if you've never seen it, uh, go take a look at it. There's no video of the entire speech. There's just videos of, um, of parts of the speech. But it's, uh, it's a wonderful speech, and it's a wonderful speech about not just baseball, but about, um, about, about humanity and about living one's life and how to approach life in the face of adversity. So Lou Gehrig, number eight. Now we go back again to Cy Young. They, they named the pitching award after him. They did it because he had 511 wins. Yeah, no one's going to hit, no one's going to get 400, and certainly no one will ever get 500. A long career, 22-year career. Now, he, he kind of straddled the late 19th century and the early 20th century. And he averaged about 330 innings a year. It's a crazy amount of pitching that was done. And his war over this time is 165. So a lot of wins above replacement that Cy Young was able to generate for his teams. Widely regarded as one of the great pitchers of his era. Um, and, you know, it's hard to measure pitching across eras. How would Cy Young have done against modern-day, well-conditioned hitters? We don't know. But what we do know is that in his time, Young, like Walter Johnson, dominated their league uh, and uh, really defined pitching for the early 20th century. Now we get to number 10. And number 10 is uh, Hannes Wagner. Shortstop for the Pirates. Uh, I've got the, his, he's got that famous T206 baseball card up on there on the right, which had been the most expensive baseball card of all time up until recent times. And there were a couple of other cards that went for more. Uh, Wagner was a uh, shortstop. The Pirates, eight batting titles. He had 101 homers. But remember, this is in the kind of the dead ball era. I think most people realize that had he played in the post 1920s 20s and 30s he would have been hitting home runs he was a big guy he was a burly guy he couldn't hit home runs but in this year he chose mostly to go for doubles triples uh, he had a 21 year career 130 wins above replacement generally seen as a great defensive shortstop of the time again we can't really measure it we don't really know but those who watched him those who saw him uh, and his his contemporaries saw him as a great defensive shortstop so Hannes Wagner comes in at number 10. Now, what I did is I also put together an honorable mention list. So I put 10 players as honorable mentions. They're listed alphabetically, not 11 through 20. And these are players that I think I would put on uh, my next list, next 20. And you see here, there weren't many contemporary players in the first 10. Um, but here, you're starting to get more uh, recent ball players. Okay. Uh, so the list would be Joe DiMaggio, Jimmy Fox, who's here, uh, Bob Gibson, the great Cardinals pitcher, Ken Griffey Jr., the Mariners out center fielder, Rogers Hornsby, Randy Johnson, Greg Maddox, uh, Christy Mathewson, the uh, early 20th century pitcher, Mickey Mantle, and Tris Speaker. So this is, uh, again, we have more, more recent players as well as some older ball players, And I think this is a, a pretty good list of uh, from 11 to 20. But you're probably asking yourself, there are some people that are missing from these 20, this list of 20. Uh, and that's when we get to the issue of steroids. Three in particular, Barry Bonds, Roger Clemens, and Alex Rodriguez. Uh, just look at the numbers for Bonds and Clemens. I mean, by the numbers alone, Bonds and Clemens merit their clearly top 10 uh, greatest players of all time. I think there's no doubt about that. 
You know, Clemens, the modern day pitcher, has 354 wins, 4,600 strikeouts. He won the Cy Young seven times, as well as an MVP. Uh, Bonds holds the home run record. He almost has 3,000 hits. He's got an OPS over one, a war of one, uh, 162. These are Ruth-like numbers. And he also, uh, if Clemens wins the Cy Young seven times, Bonds wins the MVP seven times. Rodriguez is probably just a cut below them. He's got almost 700 homers, 3,000 hits, three-time MVP. Probably uh, those numbers get him in the, the, the 11 to 20 uh, rankings. But there's the issue of steroids, right? How, how are they impacted by steroids? And how can we trust the numbers? Uh, have steroids corrupted these numbers? And this is an open question. I, I will say before Bonds and Clemens started taking steroids, uh, and A-Rod too, these were generally recognized as some of the great young players. They took steroids not to become great players, but to kind of keep playing at a much higher level and compete against those who were taking steroids. And they were competitive athletes. They were gonna take every advantage they could. The Hall of Fame still hasn't decided how to figure out uh, what to do with Bonds and Clemens. Um, so I think we're gonna have to just put these three individuals off to the side, and recognize what they did. Uh, and I think in future years, we'll have a better sense of how to measure those steroid years. Um, you know, these guys weren't like Mark McGuire or Sosa or a Brady Anderson, who all of a sudden out of nowhere hits 40 home runs in a year. I mean, these were great players. Uh, and if they'd, they'd never taken steroids, they would have been, they would have had great Hall of Fame careers. Another question you might be wondering is, what about Negro League players? Uh, and we don't have them on the list. Just uh, a couple of months ago, Major League Baseball recognized the Negro League as a professional league on par with Major League Baseball. And they're, they're, they're setting about working to integrate the statistics from the Negro Leagues into uh, those for Major League Baseball. But it's still pretty hard to measure. Uh, it's not, not a perfect measurement between the leagues. Statistics weren't as great, they weren't kept as great in the Negro Leagues. Um, but we do have a sense that some of the great ball players in the Negro Leagues, had they had the chance to play in Major League Baseball, had there never been no segregation, would have been the greatest players of all time especially Josh Gibson, Oscar Charleston, the pitcher Satchel Paige, who comes into the major leagues in his 40s uh, and, and has some pretty good years. Uh, these were great players, and I think they would have been great players, um, you know, had they been accepted into the major leagues. Finally, uh, the question is, what about today's players? Which players today do you think will be great players, will, 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 will break into that great greatest players of all time? Um, Mike Trout, often seen as one of the great players. Albert Pujols, who was just released from the, uh, from the, card, uh, from the Angels and uh, picked up by the Dodgers, but has had a tough, his last few years haven't been good. He's had a long career, but he's put up great numbers, Hall of Fame numbers. Uh, pitchers like Clayton Kershaw and Jacob deGrom, what about these players? So we don't know. We'll have to see how their careers play out. Um, but that will, it's interesting to see which of these current players will be seen as great players uh, at, down the road. Um, so with that, I'm going to end here. And Scott, we want to, uh, we'll, uh, I'm gonna, I'll stop sharing. Do you want to continue the conversation? Sure. Um, so Ben, that was a great, that was absolutely great. It's interesting to see your methodology of how you go about uh, breaking these down and having a somewhat reasoned approach to who's in your top 10 list. Um, between you and me, I would have not included Cy Young or Stan Musial. I would have included Christy Mathewson and Rogers Hornsby. But yes. that's just a difference of opinion. And I'm sure that there are others out there who will disagree with both of us. I, it's, it's funny. I had Hornsby in the top 10 and then bumped him out as well. It, it, you know, it's a case where you're, you're, this is wholly subjective, right? This is just, and you know, th this, there's no magic formula to this, but yes, I had both of those kind of bouncing up into the 10 and then I, I end, end up taking them down. So here's my question. Did you play baseball yourself? Yes, I played baseball as a child. I played all through high school. I played varsity baseball, and then I did not make my college baseball team, which wasn't a surprise. I, I wasn't. I was a pretty average player, 
Um, so I didn't play. And then, you know, after college, I played a lot of fair, fair amount of softball. Where did you develop your love of baseball? I think for a lot of people, it was my dad. You know, we, we played catch. We watched baseball games. He took me to games. He coached me in Little League. And uh, it was just a sort of a cultural thing as well. Growing up, I grew up in, I'll date myself, in the 70s. And baseball was still, you know, still the national pastime. Baseball cards were huge. We all had baseball card collections. Uh, we, we flipped baseball cards. That was a big thing to do at school. You brought your pack of, you know, your big wad of baseball cards and you flipped them. You tried to get more cards. Um, you know, that, it, that was just, um, you know, it's a little bit different today. You know, we, we played baseball, pick up baseball games. We just go, go to the field and play. So, um, yeah, no, I, I just loved it. It was just part of, part of the air around me. It's part of what, what people did, and I enjoyed it. Well, the uh, staying with the subject of subjective choice, let's move from who were the greatest players to who's your favorite baseball player. So that is a question... Uh, I have to admit, any kind of question like, you know, what's your favorite movie? What's your favorite book? Who's your favorite president? I just, I, I never like those questions because it's always hard for me because I'll always show, you know, throw out, you know, oh, here are five movies I love, you know, and then, oh, here are five more, and I can't really decide amongst them. So it's sort of like that for baseball. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a Yankee fan, so I always have, you know, I got a you know, sweet spot for the, for the Yankees. And, uh, you know, I mean, one player I like who's not in the top 20 and I love for more personal reasons is, is I was like Yogi Berra and I got a chance to meet him towards the end of his life. And, and that was fun. Um, he's just, he's, he's a great, he was a great guy, uh, an interesting character as well as a hall of fame player. Uh, certainly not a top 10, not top 20, but probably top 50 ball player of all time. One of the, you know, two or three greatest catchers of all time, I think. Bench, I think, is the first, the greatest. But um, yeah, I like Barra. I'm trying to think if there's any other ball players that I really. Uh, and, oh, and and the other sticking with that theme. Growing up, I like Thurman Munson as a Yankee. He was um, again another character whose life was cut short very young in a plane accident. And I remember that day very clearly when he died. Um, but he represented a kind of gritty gritty ball player. He had the big walrus mustache. He was always dirty and kind of slovenly. And there was a toughness to him and no nonsense play to him. And he was, he was a terrific player as well. Uh, terrific hitter and a terrific defensive catcher. So yeah, I was like Munson too. As a baseball historian, do you have an opinion as to who was the greatest baseball writer? It's <laughs> another good question. Uh, you know, Who's the baseball? I mean, one person that I've always liked in his writings, and he's still around today, although I don't read him very much. He's, he writes for the Washington Post, but he's uh, there are some collections of his writings from the 70s and 80s that are great, is Tom Boswell. Um, and the books, I'm trying to remember um, the titles of the books. They, I'm, I'm sort of blanking on that, but he wrote a number of collections of, of baseball writings that I think are, are, are wonderful. They're, they're just, they're really terrific books. I mean, Roger Angel, of course, is the, you know, the great writer, um, but, uh, yeah, Boswell. I also think, uh, if you've never read Updike's essay on Ted Williams, that's a terrific piece, but not by a sports writer, but by a novelist. It's a terrific piece of, of not just baseball writing, just writing in general. So thank you very, very much, Professor. This was a great, great uh, time here this afternoon, and we wish you the very best. So that's it for this week's Someone You Should Know. Professor Vin Canato, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks for having me. Bye. Okay.